Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our webinar today. This is the third and final webinar in our Innovation and Leadership series and uh, that we've been hosting this summer, so really appreciate you being here today. I'm Susan Schempf with the Wallace Center, and I'm delighted to be joined today by an amazing group of colleagues and leaders from the Center for Regional Food Systems, Farm to Institution New England, and the Hawaii Good Food Alliance, and we'll be having a discussion today about their strategies and practices for collective impact in community food systems through networks and alliances. Um, these, true, these folks are really leaders um, in the national space and so we're really grateful to have an opportunity to connect and learn with them today. Um, before we get started, we're going to quickly run through um, an agenda overview. All right, so I'm going to give a quick technical orientation um, and then give a little bit of background on this webinar series and introduce our first speaker, who will be Rich Pirog from the Center for Regional Food Systems. We'll then hear from Colleen Matz with the Michigan Farm to Institution Network, um, Peter Allison and Hannah Layton from Farm to Institution New England, and Tina Tamai from the Hawaii Good Food Alliance. All right, so real quickly, um, just want to talk a little bit about what this series is all about. Um, and as you know, the Wallace Center earlier this year launched the Food Systems Leadership Network, um, which is a national community of practice focused on strengthening community leadership and organi organizational effectiveness of community-based nonprofits working in food systems. Um, and over this past um, two years, or several years really, we've had the opportunity to connect with food systems leaders across the U.S. and really hear about what you're chewing on and wrestling with as you're doing your work. Um, and one of the things that we've heard a lot about is an interest in learning new and better ways of working and organizing and collaborating with others, um, both within our organizations and in partnership with other community organizations um, and other partners. Um, and so based on what we heard from you, we started to shape up this webinar series um, where we could explore innovations in leadership at the individual organizational and systems level. Um, so today's webinar is the third in a series of three. Um, the first focused on organizations that are intentional about cultivating leadership within their own staff. Um, and so we heard from Red Tomato and Thunder Valley CDC, who highlighted their um, really inspirational organizational transitional stories or transition stories um, and learned a lot through that first webinar. Um, two weeks ago, we heard from um, Kristen Aguilar at La Cinea Food Center and Kelsey Ducheneau from the Native Youth Food Sovereignty Alliance, um, who both shared how they've adopted alternative organizational models that better reflect their social justice values. Um, and really, two really great webinars. The archives of both of those are on ngfn.org and in our Food Systems Leadership Network online community of practice under courses. So I encourage you all to get over there and check those out. Um, and so for this, for this third and final webinar, we wanted on, to really focus on the fact that really no matter where you're working in food systems, um, you have to be able to work in partnership and collaboration with others um, and ideally strive towards collective impact. Um, networks and alliances are a very common um, strategy in our sector, but I think a lot of us are still learning how to do it well, myself included. Um, so today we'll be learning for some colleagues who really embrace network approaches, um, and I'm personally looking forward to learning from them as well. Um, so without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce Rich Pirog, um, who is the Director of at the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State University. Rich is responsible for the strategic direction, management, and achievement of mission for the center. The center's work includes food hubs, farm to school, and farm to early childhood education, healthy food access and financing, food policy councils, and beginning in organic farming. Um, Pirog's re recent writings and research include impact of local foods, evolution of the local food movement, structural racism present in the U.S. food system, and building networks to address social and racial equity, health, and economic challenges in the food system. Um, Rich, you are a busy man, so I really appreciate you spending some time with us today and giving us an overview of collective impact. So take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. And, uh, you know, all of us on this on this webinar are aware of all the different types of challenges that we have in the food system. Very few of these challenges are, are simple and require what I would call linear uh, solutions. Like, uh, you know, if you, if, for example, if you had a bug uh, problem in your field, you have to identify what the bug is first. That's a simple example of a solution. Obviously, the management gets more complex. But uh, most of these challenges, they're, they're very complex. They require multi-stakeholder solutions. Uh, they 
require more adaptive techniques and emergent techniques. You sort of try things out. You, you know, we all are familiar with the, the phrase learning to fly the plane while we're building the plane. You know, we all, we all know at a, at, a, at a deep level that a single organization can't solve complex problems on their own. And yet, we're still sort of set up in the way that a lot of grant makers still fund individual organizations to solve problems. Now, those organizations may take on many, many partners, but again, the awards made to an individual organization, and then the evaluation that usually takes place with that often cre uh, credits success that's attributable to that organization or the leader of the organization, when we all know full well that it, it really is a, a system that we're helping to create to, to try to to address the problem, and that that's that, that's a system both from the standpoint of partnerships, uh, and in levels of uh, of who does the work and what their roles are, and all those very very uh, important pieces that require a lot of communication. And I'm moving on to the next slide. And uh, I really like this quote. This um, I've read this recently, and it came from Bill Gates and. Um, and I always have the problem with this word modernity, but basically modern times. Uh, he says modern times is a miracle of systems. And we miss the progress that's happening right in front of us when we look for heroes instead of systems. Now, I'm, I'm not going to throw any shade on heroes because heroes are really important. But we all know that when we really get something to work and then like one person or two people get a lot of the credit, there's hundreds of people. There's thousands of people that really are making that difference. And so Bill says, if you want to improve something, if you want to address change, look for ways to build better systems. And that's why this idea and the framework of collective impact is so important. Um, the definition that Connie and Kramer, who uh, wrote a series of articles, I think started in 2011, first appeared in the Stanford Innovation Review, um, that really sort of reframed the idea of, of multi-stakeholder um, um, uh, partnerships. They talk about the long-term commitment of a group of important actors from different sectors working on a common agenda solving a specific social problem. And Connie and Kramer go on in Collective Impact to talk about these five conditions. These conditions do not need to be all there at the same time when you start an initiative or when you, uh, when you begin using this framework. But if they don't, if these con uh, conditions don't show up and don't show up in a very robust way, you probably are not um, really achieving your overall goals. And when you start looking for problems like why aren't we making progress, this is one of the first things you would look at when you use a collective impact framework. Naming, naming that the stakeholders themselves have a common agenda, that the the activities that the various stakeholders are doing are mutually reinforcing. They're complementary. They're synergistic. You don't have folks that are sort of going out and doing their own thing or that's redundant with another organization. The communication is, is constant. Well, those of you out there that have lifelong partners, you know, or, or, or just people that you've committed um, sharing your life with in some way or fashion, you have to uh, communicate constantly. You can't take anything for granted. And in a collective impact framework, that is critical. You can't take for granted that, uh, well, that they know what I'm talking about. I don't need to communicate that with that partner. You wind up having problems. Shared measurement, this idea of having a, a set of metrics that all the stakeholders uh, and partners agree on, and there's a way of measuring it that they're using common um, method, uh, methods to do it is real important. And then last, but certainly not least, this idea of a backbone organization. And these backbone organizations are organizations that, that funders don't always, and until more recently, really see the value of. They, they foster the health of the collaboration infrastructure. They keep all of the organizations talking to each other, working together, and addressing uh, problems. And it's real important that those backbone organizations, they're not self-anointed. These are uh, backbone organizations that everybody realizes, hey, this organization, that's, that's their role. They're really keeping us together. They're, they're making sure we are collaborating. So 
as, as Susan said in the beginning, a lot of this work is, is tied into building very effective networks. And it's really important, you know, in this overview to remember that not all networks are the same. And, you know, you, you, if you have a, a, a survey and you say, oh, yeah, I participate in a network, well, everybody participates in networks, but the types of networks that one has really addresses whether or not you're going to be able to, with that network, uh, address systems change. Van de Venner, who I had the chance of working with over a decade ago, and he wrote a really great small little book called Networks That Work, along with Mendel, um, talks about three types of networks, cooperating, coordinating, and collaborating. You see those on the left side of the slide on your screen. And the, the types of networks, the way he describes them, uh, are, are based on the risk level to the members and the chance for systemic change potential. So we all belong to cooperating networks, right? We're all on listservs. We all try different kinds of uh, learning approaches. We share information. Um, th those things are great, but in and of themselves, uh, there is, there's low risk to the members and there's little chance for systemic change. You build up from coordinating to collaborating networks and you see the risk level going up higher. The higher the risk, the better chance of actually getting systemic change, right? I know this is intuitive, but it's real important to sort of see this and how it plays out in your networks. Real important and that Van de Vendor talks about that I think is critical here is that the networks, the networks that take the most risk that are collaborating networks have methods in place to resolve conflicts. If, you know, people, because they are people and they talk to each other, they're going to have conflicts. They have different ideas. You have to have methods to do that across your network. Uh, pursuing long-term system creation, uh, resource reallocation, even the, the idea of joint hiring of staff across the network or the kind of trust building um, strategies that uh, increase your risk but also increase your chance for systemic change. So I'm just going to end here with uh, just connecting this back to our own work at the Center for Regional Food Systems. We use the, uh, the, the center has at its, as its heart in Michigan, sort of the sun of our solar system in Michigan is the Michigan Good Food Charter, uh, six goals, 25 priority agenda items. We use the collective impact framework. The charter itself is really our common agenda. Uh, uh, our center works as, as a primary backbone organization to foster collaboration in Michigan around the idea of food that's healthy, fair, affordable, and green. We also uh, use a racial equity lens and are developing additional racial equity metrics. So that's a very quick overview tying collective impact to networks. Really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on, the, on this uh, webinar. And what I'd like to do now is turn things over to my coworker and colleague, Colleen Matz. Colleen is the Farm to Institution Specialist at the Center for Regional Food Systems. She's also the Michigan core partner for the Michigan National Farm to School Network. She is definitely a national leader, and she also coordinates the Michigan Farm to Institution Network, which will be part of the comments that Colleen will be sharing with you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. and then uh, take away, Colleen. Thank you, Rich. So first, I'd like to give a little bit of background and context to our work with the Farm to Institution Network. Our mission is to help reach the Michigan Good Food Charter goal of sourcing 20% of food from Michigan sources by the year of 2020. And this is one of the goals of our charter that Rich mentioned. And this one is specifically designed for our institutions in the state. Our purpose is to provide a space for learning, sharing, and working together to get more local food to institutions. So we try to help institutions, including early childhood programs, schools, colleges, hospitals, and senior facilities find, buy, and use more local foods. We try to help farmers and food suppliers offer the foods institutions want in the forms they need. And we try to help eaters at those institutions identify, value, and enjoy those local foods on their trays. We see institutions as good food access points, and we seek for all Michiganders to have access to good food at the institutions they interact with throughout their lifetimes. 
So part of our role is creating knowledge through new collaborative projects, but our role is also to connect the dots and to cultivate relationships and to provide the framework of support for the ongoing work in the field by the practitioners who are really doing this work and making farmed institution happen. So in referring back to Rich's slides, I think we at the Michigan Farmed Institution Network do have all of the elements of a collective impact framework even within this network. I think we also have all of the elements of a cooperating network with some elements of a coordinating network. So we do engage in some activities requiring mutual reliance, but we still have some ways to go in pushing our organizational boundaries. And for those who might be familiar with the Institute of Conservation Leadership's six types of cooperative efforts, and I know the National Farm to School Network refers to these networks um, as models, our Farm to Institution Network seems to be a combination of a network and a campaign coalition model. So we certainly share information and learning on an issue, and in our case, that's Farm to Institution. And we have varying levels of investment and partnership and connections across our full membership. But we are also strongly committed to working together on a specific issue. So in our case, that's helping institutions reach that 20% by 2020 goal of the charter. Some organizations have also provided staff time to be directly involved in the work. And as you'll see, our core partners our um, close and varied partners have collectively invested time and finances into developing and sharing tools and resources towards that goal. So you'll see here our initial structure when we first launched in 2014. The Farmed Institution Network began as an effort to work across institution types after we here at the center had developed a wealth and breadth of experience in farm to school, and some colleagues of ours at the Ecology Center, which is a nonprofit based in Ann Arbor, developed the same with farm to hospital, and that was primarily through their role with healthcare without harm here in Michigan. So initially when we launched in 2014, we were co-led um, by myself and the Ecology Center, and we would meet on a weekly basis between us co-leads. We, have, uh, we had a management team of center staff, the Ecology Center staff, and MSU Extension, and all together that was about uh, five and a half folks, um, but definitely way less than FTE. And these folks all provided some of their time to operations, and we would meet every other month. We have an advisory committee um, that continues today with farmed institution practitioners from the field. We had just uh, eight members then, and we met with them on a quarterly basis to provide feedback on our plans, direction, and ideas. And we meet with individual members more as needed if we have collaborative projects in place. We have a leadership team of state agency staff from the Michigan Department of Education, Michigan Department of Agriculture, which is now Agriculture and Rural Development. And at that time, we also had um, a leadership team member from the Michigan Department of Community Health. We had three subcommittees that were led by subcommittee chairs. These were members of our management team. And the subcommittees were an avenue through which our general members could participate in the work of the network through monthly or quarterly meetings. So these subcommittees were outreach, impacts, which is our research arm, and then tech ed, which is technical assistance and education. When we launched, we had about 200 members and network membership was and remains open to institutional food service directors and buyers, as well as farmers, food vendors and suppliers, advocates and supporters and researchers. And by joining the network, members have the opportunity to use their skills and knowledge to help shape farmed institution programs in Michigan. They can network and participate in our learning activities and social events across the state and they can be part of the larger movement to help take local food purchasing at Michigan institutions to the next level. And then finally, we have our Cultivate Michigan membership, and Cultivate Michigan is our local food purchasing and tracking campaign to help institutional food service professionals find, serve, and promote local foods in institutional settings. Cultivate Michigan was also launched in 2014 along with the network, and this is our shared measurement or local food purchasing data platform 
for our work and it continues to be the most difficult um, and kind of most challenging part of our work today. So here is our structure now after we've had some staff transi transitions in 2018, namely our staff partner from the Ecology Center stepped down from the co-lead role and that was mainly due to the balance of work and um, prioritizing some more pressing needs. So that on our end could have been an emergency and it felt like a bit of an emergency at the time, but it definitely provided us with the time to rethink our structure and refocus and streamline some of our efforts. And I think we needed that anyway. Um, it certainly took some time to fully make that transition because they were very deeply embedded in the work, clearly. Um, but in the end, I think um, it may have been what we needed to be doing at the time, and that crisis led to some more efficient operations. So while our management team might be a bit smaller and we just have me serving in that coordinator role for the network, our advisory committee has grown. We now have 14 farmed institution practitioners in the field. Our leadership team of state agency staff has changed just a little bit. That Michigan Department of Community Health staff member that was on our leadership team um, is no longer, and that's partly because that department was merged with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services into a very large department that's a little harder for us to navigate through. Also of note, our subcommittees have become more of an organizing tool for us to get work done, so that's kind of moved into the background, and instead of doing subcommittee meetings on a regular basis, we now have every other month virtual full network meetings, so all of our network members can be more engaged and aware of our activities, and that also is intended to allow for more cl cross collaboration. So that's something that we just started this year. Uh, we'll let you know how it goes because we're still kind of feeling that out. Our general membership is up to about 500 people, and our last breakdown showed that the largest group of members were from institutions, most from K through 12 schools and hospitals. The second largest was nonprofit members, and the third was university and research folks not food service folks from universities. Uh, but we also have members who are farmers, food suppliers, folks from government at all levels, extension, food hubs, public health, agricultural commodity groups, and some consultants. And then finally, our Cultivate Michigan membership is now up to 66 participating institutions with eight other businesses and organizations. So since our platform is really designed for institutional members, we let other types of businesses who might not fit into those boxes quite as easily know that our platform is open to them too if they want to be tracking their local food purchases, um, but it might not always be the most applicable to their work. But we're interested in tracking with them if they are. So this snapshot here, you can see is from our Cultivate Michigan website, and that's just one of our platforms for communicating with and through our network. We also have a network landing page, a Facebook page, and a Twitter account, and we use constant contact for email blasts and e-newsletters, and that was something that we actually had to shift over from the Ecology Center to the Center for Regional Food Systems. Our network activities over time have generally remained similar, but I like to think that we continue to be creative and nimble and take advantage of windows of opportunity to try new things. And we delegate as much as possible within the network, and we, when we try to do that, we really need it. And we try to hold ourselves and each other accountable, which is sometimes a challenge. We collaborate and partner on just about everything we do. So while that might take more time and planning, um, it always works out to our benefit. So we definitely mean it when we say we are a good partner. And we prioritize sharing the stories of the practitioners in the field. So this is just a sampling, but here are some of the things we've tried. Our seasonal featured food promotions and education are an ongoing activity for Cultivate Michigan, and I think at this point this is one of our signature activities. We feature seasonal foods, um, seasonal Michigan foods, and we've been doing so since 2014. So at this point we've featured 18 seasonal foods, 
and we recently released a Cultivate Michigan sourcing guide that lists availability of all these foods by vendor, and that's their local availability, of course. And we um, used to do that on a food by food basis, so that's something that we've streamlined along the way. Along with these promotions, we also host Cultivate Michigan tours, including a couple in partnership with our Michigan Meat Network. These tours are a way for food service professionals to learn more about their local food system, but we have also found that they are a better way to engage with agricultural commodity groups. So that's been an interesting byproduct of these tours. We've also assisted in promotion for events that highlight our featured foods. So that includes Michigan Apple Crunch, which happens every year in October, and the Michigan Cherry Slurp, which is a new event as of a couple of years ago in February. And both of those are led by Cherry Capital Foods, which is a local foods distributor food hub here in Michigan, and we support them in that effort. We host joint network meeting with the Michigan Food Hub Network. And most recently, we all together with the Michigan Local Food Council Network hosted a joint network action meeting, which was intended to be more of a day-long working meeting between and across those three networks. This year, we also hosted a series of Cultivate Michigan Marketplace events. And these were designed as regional events with local co-hosts to help institutional buyers and food suppliers and farmers meet in person and make that face-to-face -face connection to be able to begin a buyer-seller relationship. And this was possible through a USDA Farm to School grant that we partnered with our Michigan Department of Education and Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development staff on. And finally, um, for the sampling at least, we have Michigan on the Menu, which is a new campaign that's specifically for hospitals to help them kind of make some goals for local food purchasing in the near future. And this is something that our Ecology Center partners are continuing to bring and add value to the network with um, by leading this effort and working with the Michigan Hospital Association. And just a note on a few things that we plan to try in the future, we're hoping to do some research projects to better understand food service operations at state-funded universities. We plan to host some Cultivate Michigan orientations. We plan to um, implement a Farm to School Leadership Institute and gather up some funding to do that. And we want to get, engage more with the Fair Food Pledge of Migrant Legal Aid to strengthen some of our racial equity work and our work in that fair space of um, good food here in Michigan. So then I wanted to wrap up with some general themes around challenges and opportunities. And it's hard to summarize, um, you know, many, many years, at least four years of experience into just a couple of buckets. And I think challenges often can make for new opportunities, and new opportunities can then make for new challenges, so they kind of loop on each other. But from my experience, those major themes are kind of in the practice side of the work and then also in the coordination side of the work. So out in the field, we have um, food systems development, which continues to be something that we're all working towards and um, is something that we have to work within. So we have institutional demand that can certainly help drive food systems development, and it's done so here in Michigan, including with companies like Michigan Farm to Freezer. Um, but buyers are always seeking more local foods in the forms they want and through the channels they need. So that's kind of a constant push-pull. And then buyer and seller connections, they seem to be best made on a one-on-one -on -one basis or face-to-face, -face, so that certainly takes a lot of time. Um, and that's something that we rely on a lot of our local and regional partners for throughout the state. And we have a particular challenge with transients of school food service directors moving around. So because of that challenge, we have a, more of a focus on regional network development and an emphasis on farmed institution teams and local partners. And then on the coordination side of things, when you're working as closely together as we were and are with the Ecology Center, MSU Extension, and some of our other partners, there are always challenges embedded in that partner development and things like professional development and accountability and staff transitions are challenges that you have to work through. And especially 
since you are all working from different organizations and don't have any supervisory power over each other, um, then you have to really focus in on that self-accountability and accountability to the group. So to help address some of that, we've developed and update SOPs, standard operating procedures. We try our best to regularly make space for leadership development and delega delegation. And we have developed extensive and varied partnerships so that when different needs and opportunities come up, we can take advantage of those. Finally, on the funding note, um, as Rich had mentioned before, it's hard to get funding for network activities and development as such, and we've only been somewhat successful in seeking grant funding. I think our work is complicated and how we do it is kind of complicated, so it's a little hard to explain. So we try to keep the context very simple ask for funding for small bits of the work that are easier to explain from traditional funders at least and to get creative either with funds that we happen to have access to or through partners um, that we can gain access to and we've had some good success with that with some agricultural commodity groups that we wouldn't have expected to be such strong partners including the um, cherry marketing institute who funded a uh, promotion of our cherry materials and got those out to all of the schools and hospitals in the state. And finally, and in summary, it's that big picture that's sometimes hard to keep an eye on, to keep your sight on, and that's what's most important. So we do need to always do better work in tending to that fair component of the work within our network specifically, and try to keep that big picture in mind in the midst of day-to-day -day management and coordination and network building and fundraising, all of the day-to-day -day details. So for us, these elements of a good food system, healthy, green, fair, and affordable, can and should be our guiding lights going forward. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colleen and Rich, um, for just an, an awesome overview of the work that y'all are doing there in Michigan. Um, y'all have really been kind of the, the guiding star for so many of us with your work um, in that state. So really appreciate um, your overview. And I know there's been a couple of questions that have come in, so we'll try and get those um, during the Q&A session. Um, but next up, I want to um, pass the mic over to Peter Allison and Hannah um, Layton from Farm to Institution New England. Um, so Peter is the Executive Director for Farm to Insti Institution New England, which is a six-state cross-sector regional network that is transforming the food system by mobilizing the power of New England institutions. Peter serves on advisory boards for Food Solutions New England and several state and food-oriented organizations. Um, three decades of prior work include leadership roles on innovative environmental and sustainability initiatives in the nonprofit business and public sectors. Um, and Hannah is finds research and evaluation manager. Hannah oversees FINE's metrics project where she works to collect, analyze, and share farm to institution data with stakeholders across the supply chain. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today and take it away. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for having us. We're very happy to be here. Let me make sure I... All right. So thank you, got that. Um, I think today I am going to spend a little bit of time just introducing FINE as an organization, talking about our mission, a little bit about our history and our programs before I hand it over to Peter to kind of walk through some of the more nuanced aspects of our, um, our network. So I'm gonna dive right in and talk about FINE as an organization. Um, Farmed Institution New England really serves as a backbone organization for a cross-sector farmed institution network um, in New England. And our network consists of nonprofits, institutions, producers, distributors, funders, government agencies, and others that are working along the farmed institution supply chain. And our mission as an organization is really to mobilize the power of New England institutions to transform our food system. We've been around for going on eight years now, and we were created really as a partnership. Um, around that time, regional farm to school leaders were recognizing that there was a need for a broader um, a uh, broader farm to institution organization. And around the same time, the six chief agricultural commissioners in New England were also developing strategies for keeping farmland in production, and they had identified uh, institutional markets as a, a valuable growth area. And so FINE was really developed out of those two conversations. 
We focus on institutions for a number of reasons. Um, we know that they provide a diverse and stable market for the region's farmers and fishers. Uh, we focus on three primary institutional sectors, K through 12 schools, uh, hospitals, and colleges and universities with dining services. And our research shows that across the institutions, um, they're already spending about 17% of their budgets on local food. And we're consistently hearing that um, they wanna be purchasing more local food. We also know that about a quarter of our population across the six states are accessing institutions every day. Um, our research shows that about 3.7 million students, employees, and patients are spending time at New England institutions daily. And we take a regional approach um, for a few different reasons. Probably the biggest one is that the six New England states are pretty small. We have a shared history and culture, which lends itself really well to collaboration. Um, we also see a, a bit of an imbalance in terms of the northern New England states and the southern New England states in terms of producers and consumers. So the northern New England states have uh, more producers and less consumers, whereas the southern New England states have more consumers uh, and less producers. And we also see that um, distributors, food service management companies, and others that are working in the middle of the supply chain are often operating across those state lines as well. As I mentioned, we focus on three primary sectors, K through 12 schools, colleges, and hospitals. Um, and we're always exploring ways to support other institutional sectors as well, um, including the um, correction sector. So when we look at New England institutions, we're talking about about 4,600 K through 12 schools, 210 colleges and universities, and 256 hospitals. And we have about 35,000 farms across the six states. So figuring out how we can connect those institutions with those farms is what we're really all about. And before I hand it over to Peter, I'll just give a, a little introduction to what we what we offer as an organization, because we, we have our hands in a lot of different areas. Um, so our three primary network services kind of fall under these three buckets, uh, events and trainings, communications, and research and metrics. Our biggest event that we host is our biannual Farm to Institution Summit. Uh, our third summit is coming up this April at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and that brings together about 500 stakeholders from across the Farm to Institution supply chain for workshops, training sessions, field trips, networking opportunities, and a lot of other activities. Um, and then we also host um, smaller trainings, workshops, and um, statewide events as well. Um, we put a lot of work into our communications platform. Um, we try hard to share resources and toolkits and best practices for those that are working on the ground in the region, and we do that through uh, blogs, case studies, and a newsletter. And then our research and metrics work is really designed to help us better understand the system that we're trying to change. Uh, so beyond those network services, we also work to fill gaps that we identify um, in the region through our programmatic work. So a couple of examples of some of our programs are the Farm and Seed to Campus Network, which was developed because we saw that there were backbone organizations supporting farm to school and farm to hospital in the region, but there wasn't really an organization that was doing that same kind of um, support work for campuses. And so FIND now serves um, as that kind of backbone organization for farm and seed to campus in the region. Um, our food service program is designed to work with institutions so that they can develop their RFPs and contracts to include more uh, language around local food procurement. And then one of our newer arms of work is public policy. We've recently launched a farm to institution policy working group that's helping us to identify uh, key levers um, for policy that can help to get more local food into institutions and support other farm to institution activity. And then beyond that, we also support a number of communities of practice, and those include um, COPs for food hubs, processors, dining operators, and then FINE also coordinates a uh, national farm to institution metrics collaborative. I think I'm going to hand it over to Peter to walk us through some of the, the challenges, strategies, and, and lessons learned from our, our network. Thanks, Hannah, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, so building on what Hannah's laid out in terms of sort of how Fine got started in our the work and how we're focusing our efforts now, 
just want to talk about a few of the challenges that we've identified and some of the lessons that we've learned, um, somewhat similar to those that Colleen uh, referenced as well. So the first is realizing a need to continually sort of be tuned in to uh, our partners, the changing uh, political climate, the culture, and to evolve and adapt our structure and programs uh, to meet those changing situations. So we, we started about seven and a half years ago as a, real, a pretty loosely organized um, group that had a, had a grant from the USDA and then some other funders that came along. So when it started, it was really a leadership team of about five people who are all representing the NGO community, farm to school, uh, farm uh, preservation, one processor who is based in an NGO. And then as almost an afterthought, they decided it would be useful to have a coordinator to help keep all this stuff working together. And so I was actually, at the time, directing another organization. They wondered if I'd help pitch in on this project um, on a part-time temporary basis. Over the years, um, we've grown from that sort of very small sort of insular group of leaders, five of them, to a much bigger leadership team um, initially. And, and it, at the outset, we really relied heavily on that group of advisors to do some of our communications and strategy work and um, events and like picking the food for the events and uh, doing real fundraising and development work, partner development work. Um, so much so, we relied on so much so that we actually uh, contracted with them and paid them a stipend to help them justify their other involvement outside of their day jobs. And over time, we've added staff in some of the areas that Hannah's mentioned in terms of communications and events coordination, metrics, now policy, as well as some of that programmat programmatic effort. We realized that the small team of advisors were really being stretched beyond their bandwidth. And at the same time, we switched fiscal sponsors who felt that um, we really needed all of our staff to be hired as employees and that we couldn't compensate uh, advisors on our board. Um, and it made sense for us at that time to sort of switch to a much bigger group of advisors. And so we've gone up to a 18 person network advisory council and moving from a very small insular group to a, uh, um, a bigger group that didn't have as many connections. In fact, we did an RFP, an application process, and got a lot of people applying to be on our advisory council who we didn't have strong connections with previously. And what it meant is that we actually brought in a much more diverse set of perspectives, um, which had its own challenges. But the upside is that we have a ever-expanding network of partners who we connect with, who are food service directors, supply chain um, business leaders, um, funders, as well as still folks in the NGO community. So that's been an, um, extremely valuable for the whole Network Advisory Council collectively, um, as well as a lot of the advisory groups we have on particular committees guiding um, programs. Um, go ahead and switch to the next slide, Hannah. The next challenge um, really relates to how we balance our different roles that Hannah mentioned. So our core function is really serving as the backbone for the Farm to Institution Networking New England. Um, the communications, the events, the metrics, and now the policy work. But as mentioned, we also are working to play key leadership roles on programs that we think are have been brought forward by partners as gaps in the supply chain and that other partners are not currently filling. So as Hannah mentioned, there's a bunch of those. And then obviously, we do also have a need to keep ourselves um, funded and supported and, and connecting. So dealing with you know, staff issues and um, administrative issues, development work, all those systems that we need to put in place. The key thing that we really try and do is make sure that these different roles really sort of reinforce each other. So we don't wanna take on leadership of some program that's gonna take resources away from supporting the network as a whole but rather we wanna develop programs that will help inform the broader network strategy and really hope that the network strategy provides lessons that can be applied with direct programs. Um, so for example, we have a farm to, farm and city campus network um, that's looking at sort of broad strategies for everything from tracking and evaluation to student engagement, to working with campus farms, uh, to thinking about menuing to support the supply chain. And 
the strategies and webinars and lessons that we learn then are applied to a different program that we have called Campus Food Shift that works with just a handful of campuses each year on almost an individualized um, consulting basis. And in turn, the lessons there get fed back into the network strategy. Another example is the summit that Hannah mentioned where we're hoping that all the programs that we and many partner organizations are leading will be showcased and um, discussed and worked through at the Farmed Institution Summit. And at the same time, the summit is an incredible opportunity for us to broaden the network, the number of partners, the folks that are involved, and to raise the revenue to help support the work moving forward. So keeping those, um, working to make sure that all these different disparate efforts reinforce each other is really critical. And at the same time, to make sure that we're not doing stuff that uh, interferes with any other work that our partners are doing. Because at the end of the day, we are functionally, we are essentially a network backbone organization that's working to support all the entities that are striving to support farmed institution in, in the region. So then just my, my last slide talks a little bit about how we deal with um, lots of competing demands for our interest and efforts. Um, you know, as Hannah mentioned, we, we focus on the three um, main sectors of schools, colleges, and healthcare, but there are other sectors that could use our network and programmatic support as well. And as she mentioned, we're starting to look at the corrections sector right now in a deeper way. We also are asked to get involved in issues that are not as directly related to procurement, but for example, food waste. And supporting food waste helps save funds that can then be directed toward buying more local food. Um, we did a project last year that looked at what's the potential of food hubs to support the farmed institution um, sector the institutional supply chain. And one of the things that we do when we're thinking about these different opportunities that come along, either from a funder or a partner or some other entity, is we use this strategy filter where we look at what are the key things that we want to make sure we're advancing in terms of our mission, our geography of the six states, the sectors that we focus on, um, building the network and stakeholder awareness, and do we have the staff capacity or is there a budget to support it? And we've created a rubric that helps us evaluate these opportunities on these different lines and actually come up with a score for whether or not it makes sense for us to pursue it. We don't hold ourselves fast and tight to that rubric all the time, but it's a really useful guide to help us um, avoid uh, the opportunity that I just think it's a really cool thing for us to work on or that some funder thinks it's really something we should do. And it helps us sort of keep our integrity and keep our focus on the stuff that we've decided through our strategic planning process is really the core work that we need to do. So I think um, with that, I will turn it over and look forward to questions at the end. Great, thank you so much, Peter and Hannah. Um, really appreciate your focus on like adapting and changing with a changing context, but remaining true to mission and staying on track using that um, strategy filter. So really appreciate you sharing that. Um, and so finally, and last but not least, um, we're gonna head way out west to the Hawaiian Islands um, to hear from Tina Tamai, um, former SNAP Education Program Manager for the Hawaii Department of Health. Um, Tina Tamai fostered the growth of an effective community-based food systems network through her position while at the state agency. Um, she continues to coordinate Hawaii Good Food Alliance activities with the help of a task force team and is currently a Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Leaders Fellow. Um, Tina, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing the work that you're up to um, out there in Hawaii. Thank you so much. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the Hawaii Good Food Alliance and then talk about the process of our evolution and how we got to where we are now and end with the lessons we learned while going through this process. So the Hawaii Good Food Alliance is basically a network of communities. Um, so our mission is to increase food access and promote health, eating, and low-income communities in Hawaii. And the basic premise is that this mission can be accomplished by establishing effective um, food systems developed by the communities themselves, because we strongly believe that communities and their leaders know best what works and doesn't work in their communities. So in essence, 
the Hawaii Good Food Alliance is a community-based food systems. Um, it, so in essence, each of the members in our alliance is a community-based food systems network. Each have linked various programs and organizations in their communities to effectively get um, fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy foods to their low-income community members. The alliance was organized to support the, these communities in their work and to link and knit these leaders together so that they could share resources and ideas and to build capacity and at the same time allow us to coordinate food systems across the state to better create um, a more effective food system statewide. So essentially the, uh, our alliance is a network of networks um, networking for change on a larger scale. This alliance is actually coordinated and supported by a task force team, which we formed to serve as a backbone for this alliance group. What I want to do is really talk about, um, to start with, what makes this alliance group work? And basically, it's the people. The people, the membership of this organization basically have the same values, the same high level of commitment, and basically work the same way. They're all underground leaders who work behind the scenes for the good of their community. What we also have are very good relationships amongst all of our members um, because we have made sure and we spend a lot of time making sure that everybody is on the same page. And we are constantly facilitating relationships, checking in to see what people are thinking or doing and making sure that any misunderstandings or concerns that arise are addressed. And as a consequence, what we find is our alliance has a group mindset. Although each of our individual members are extremely strong leaders, they have a group cause mindset because we know that in order to make change on a bigger level, it takes collaboration and respect for one another and this reflects an authenticity and sincerity about the work that they're doing in their communities. So let me show you how, we all, how it all began. We really started basically just as a nutrition education program when I was the SNAP Ed program manager at the Department of Health. And basically all we were trying to do was get low income populations to change eating behavior. And the goal was to create a social norm of healthy eating and eating more fruits and vegetables. And we started in one pilot community. Um, and all we were trying to do was gather everyone around to create a multi-channel, multi-pronged messaging approach to educate people to change behavior. We were just trying to get everybody's buy-in to work together. And we nudged everybody to participate in each other's events and programs so that we would have that multi-prong and multi-event kind of um, comprehensive messaging in the community. We developed a lot of um, adjunct programs such as cooking skills training, youth programs, social marketing campaigns, and invited everyone that was able to impact this small community um, that were willing to help and actually to support the changes that we wanted to make in that community. So we had city council members, we had parks and recreational employees, we had insurers, retailers, and social marketers, all trying to work together to create this marketing campaign, but also to make policy and systems changes. Essentially, we were trying to practice a collective impact theory. And it kind of worked, except that um, that's when we thought our only problem was merely changing eating behavior. What we found is as the, that food is very complex and it involved more than just education. Of course, we all know that it involves access, farmer supply, um, and their economic situations, and it reaches into all different sectors, even including climate change. And in um, 2009, when we had the economic fallout, what we found is when this group worked together, we actually got further and had greater impact, even with less resources. And so what we really discovered was the value of collaboration. But in some ways, 
we still felt uh, a bit ineffective because we were directing from the top and I was at the Department of Health kind of dictating what should be done and people didn't move unless they had funding. Um, and I felt like I had to spot all the problems and tell people what to do. And we really still weren't reaching people and changing behavior, nor were we making long-term changes. But in that um, array of uh, meetings, what emerged was a community health, se health center, which created a food system. And what they did is they had, a, they had slowly established various programs, um, such as community and school gardens, farmer's markets, EBT access, uh, cooking programs, and even opened a cafe serving indigenous cultural foods that were cooked healthier, and knitted them together, all centering on honoring cultural indigenous foods and connecting farmers to the communities. They had, in essence, built a cultural food hub. And when we tried to replicate that to other parts of the state, um, we found that every community was really different and they had to do things in their own way. We went to the Big Island and what they did instead was utilize their food banking system to um, aggregate fruits and vegetables from farmers to create CSA boxes with EBT access and at, at affordable prices and redistribute them to remote um, low-income communities to um, create greater access to uh, fruits and vegetables. So they very much had a different approach to building food systems. At the same time, what quickly emerged was uh, that um, there were other uh, communities in our state who were also trying to um, make things better for the communities. And all were really different. And they heard about us and wanted to join in. So all of a sudden, instead of one or two community systems networks, we had um, communities from throughout the state and we now had a statewide network. People who were really hungry for support and for sharing because they were so concerned about this issue for their communities. At this point, we had a mix of the key community leaders in addition to the adjunct um, partners and organizations that we had started up with with the pilot project. Um, and what we found is that we wanted to make a difference and to have an impact on our state system and really to keep people's interest. We had to allow each community to do their own thing. And remind you at this point, we still had a one person backbone at this time, now trying to man um, a multiple community statewide um, coalition. And what we started to realize is it was getting very complex and it needed a greater expertise than a one person public health person. And that's the reason why we started to form a task force team to guide and coordinate the network. So we, I uh, tapped some of the funders that I had worked with, uh, some of the contractors we had worked with previously to form a task force team to include expertise in agricultural sustainability, financing, food banking, food security, and uh, with community and political reach. What we had at this time was a network, but we really didn't know how to utilize or harness the power inherent in, in network strategy. And it just so happened at that point that a facilitator group that is highly respected in Hawaii joined our group and really started to provide their expertise. And they provided an outsider view. And what they were looking at was this hodgepodge of networks um, and trying to figure out and trying to advise us how we could be sustainable and to keep the momentum. And after much discussion, what we decided to do is regroup and rethink how we were structured. Um, so what we did is we, we went back to the beginning and looked at what was really the core of what we were trying to accomplish and what we were really trying to support. And that was community-based food systems where community 
leaders were building distribution systems, connecting farmers to community. And that is where we're at now. We now have a base of eight key communities and the leaders of those communities meeting on a regular basis. Um, this is our core membership at this moment. And what we're also trying to do is shift our leadership from the backbone to the core members themselves so that they are the ones that are leading the charge and deciding what direction or what kinds of strategies we should be implementing. And what we found with this result was that now our alliance is much more laser focused and is really a much stronger group with more specific targets. And what has happened is the alliance feels um, that they feel so much stronger of about the group that they have formed that it's renamed itself from being a network to an alliance because they felt like they wanted to take more of an activist role. They weren't networking just to share resources any, anymore. The alliance sees themselves as taking some key um, roles in making um, transformative changes in our food systems. And as a result of that, what we've done is we've gained more traction in Hawaii. Other sectors are paying attention to us and are actually organizing their networks and consortiums to be able to work with us and network with us as networks. Um, and what we've found by doing this is we've realized what we have done is create a um, framework and a platform for others to address food systems in Hawaii. And we feel that we have gained more power and we're poised to move forward with, with, with engaging other sectors in Hawaii to actually move a social transformation. We are gaining more attention from funders and we are also gaining more political ground. So the goal of what we are trying to accomplish is to use this core membership group to start to re-network uh, with all of the partners that we had previously so that ultimately everybody is networked and we are creating uh, and that we create a momentum for a transformative social change. And this is how we ended up using a network strategy. Um, it really evolved from following the community. We really didn't have a name for what we're doing. Um, but we somehow felt that networks were working and it, we really needed to allow people to accomplish and meet their own um, goals by allowing them to do what they needed to do. And then by intersecting all these networks, we found that this was a way to address um, changing food systems and addressing the complexities of food systems in a much more impactful way. What we're able to do by networking is to address multiple problems all at once and more effectively. What we have learned from this process is first that people matter, <clears throat> excuse me, that people matter and relationships matter. More importantly, as these relationships work together, the alliance and the group has to main, stay focused on a narrow mission. When we had lots of different um, members and a lot of different um, sectors involved, um, it was harder to stay focused and make something happen, to actually make something um, achievable uh, she will happen to go forward. So the thing that we learned is you have to narrow your mission and really stay focused on that mission. And really at the same time, listen and follow what communities are saying and to evolve and be flexible when you see that there are changes or that when the environment changes. It's a long process and it's something that people have to expect um, to stay committed to, um, to stay in for the long haul. There is so much to do. What we also need to do is allow others to share in that leadership 
and not just be one sector or one organization um, leading the charge. By doing a network theory, what we've allowed people to do is actually move forward in their own direction in multiple dimensional ways. And by keeping clear and constant communication with each other, these networks can work together and really expand exponentially. Operationally, what we found is it's important to have a backbone glue, whether it's one person or one team, because this is the glue that coordinates and um, gets the group meeting on a regular basis and really moves the communications and makes sure, makes sure that everybody is on the same page and working together. What was nice to have in, in our particular situation was to have a facilitator um, that was able to act as a third party to um, kind of give us feedback what was, of what was happening in our group and in our structure, and at the same time act as kind of a um, mediator to um, get a neutral view of what uh, members were thinking about how the group was being led or the direction it was going. Some of the challenges we do face um, in uh, networking is that uh, is finding funding. Um, when we first started, there was no funding for meetings or funding even for a coordination of networks. More recently, I think this has um, become a more um, acknowledged um, strategy, and there appears to be more funding for this kind of work. Um, the other thing is keeping the momentum of the network. And that takes keeping an eye on what is going on within the organization. And also at the same time, keeping an eye on what's going on in our surroundings, our environment, for any changes or potentials for opportunities um, for partnership. And also um, to keep an eye on how we need to change in order to uh, be able to work in an, a changing environment. Um, the last challenge that I think that we are starting to um, experience is that because the network is expanding so much, um, there is a potential for duplication of work because we have, we're finding other um, organizations and networks who also are trying to do the same thing. And um, the challenge now is to define roles and partnerships so that people are working on in their own networks accomplishing the kinds of goals and missions that they have set out and yet be able to network on a larger on a larger level so that there is a um, a greater impact so this is I'll close because this is um, basically what we've learned in our experience as a network and I'm hoping that this information will be helpful in your work um, as you form um, networks and uh, try to work in food systems uh, transformation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tina. Um, I'm gonna ask the other presenters to, to quickly put on their, um, their webcams so we can see your beautiful faces. Um, we've gotten a little tight on time today, so I'm just gonna ask one quick question um, and ask you to um, leave you know, our, our participants today with just a couple of words of advice or guidance um, for those out there that are working, you know, with and through networks towards collective impact, maybe just like, what's that one nugget that you really want to share and make sure that people walk away with today, um, and whether it's encouragement or, um, you know, a little bit of advice. Um, so anybody want to jump in and get started on that? I can. Thank you, Tina. I think one of the things that we found key for this, for all of this networking, is really making sure that um, everyone has good working relationships and the backbone or somebody has to constantly um, keep check of the people involved and making sure that um, any concerns and issues are addressed and that there's communication between all of them so that they are networking and working together. Yeah, that was definitely a theme that came through in all of your presentations. So um, thank you for reinforcing that. Others? 
Uh, this this is Rich Pirog, and I just would um, build on what uh, Tina said, and but all five of those conditions uh, for collected impact are really um, are really critical, and um, they, they, you should be looking at the presence of all of those um, in in your work, um, and it's it is another test of how good your your partnerships uh, are if you've got all five of those conditions present. Thank you, Rich. I'd pipe in from New England where we have a lot of stones in the fields and uh, say leave no stone unturned. It's incredible where you'll find uh, partners and people, potential sources of ideas, inspiration, revenue um, that can be um, part of that network. Um, and you can also use the stones <clears throat> to build a wall. So that would be my two cents. Nice. That sounds very profound. It's hard to follow up on that. <laughs> um, and it's hard to pick just one. So I, I think um, hmm, I would go back towards that uh, relationship development piece. And I call it relationship maintenance that needs to happen. And that's true in life and true in professional work, uh, where you have to put in the time and put in the attention and the communication. So. Uh, relationship maintenance as well as staying open to new relationships. Great, thank you. Hannah, any last words of advice? I would just encourage everyone to keep looking for that sweet spot of knowing kind of what your role is and what your function is as a as a network, but also knowing that that involves some fluidity and flexibility based on all of the other people that you're you're working with. Great. Well, thank you all so much for spending time with us today and sharing um, both the work that you're doing and um, the lessons that you've been gleaning with the rest of us. Um, it's really been a fantastic presentation today, so thank you. Um, Hannah, do you want to quickly tell folks about um, some upcoming webinars that y'all are working on? Yeah, I'm excited to share that we have a webinar series coming soon from the National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborative, and we're partnering with the National Good Food Network um, to put this webinar series out. And as I mentioned before, we're part of this collaborative. There are about 30 members from across 20 different states, um, including Michigan Farm to Institution and the Wallace Center um, and some other national organizations. Um, and we're really a group of organizations that are working to track and measure the impact of the institutional market. Um, and so we do that in a couple of different ways. And this is a new platform that we're, we're, um, we're excited about. And we're going to focus on four main tracks. And we'll have short mini webinars within each track. Um, and each webinar will represent a different member of the collaborative. So it'll be a really um, interesting way to see what's going on in different parts of the countries, in different sectors, and at different levels. Um, so stay tuned for that. And if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to, to shoot me or Colleen an email. Great. Thank you. And we'll be sure to promote those um, through the Food Systems Leadership Network as well. So um, right. don't worry, listeners. You will be able to find out about these when they're happening. Um, and I know the Wallace Center has a couple of other upcoming um, webinars, mm. specifically this Thursday. There's one on value chain coordination and that BCC series. These have been really excellent. So check that out. National Farm to School Network has um, some great content coming out for National Farm to School Month next month in October. Um, so another webinar on Thursday. So it'll be webinar Thursday this week. Um, and also just wanted to point out there's a really great event happening up in Minneapolis, Minnesota on October 10th. Um, that's a incubator and commissary kitchen summit. So definitely check that out at the nickkitchensummit.com. Um, and that's all our time for today. So thanks everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful day and let's keep this conversation going around um, network development and cap co collective impact. I think there's a lot of interest um, from our community here to learn more. So we'll follow up with some opportunities just for continued dialogue and discussion. So everybody have a great day. Thank you.